Part 1. Directions. Closely read each of the three passages below. After each passage, there are several multiple choice questions. Select the best suggested answer to each question and record your answer on the separate answer sheet provided for you. You may use the margins to take notes as you read. Reading Comprehension Passage A It had been noisy and crowded at the Millions, and Mrs. Bishop had eaten too many little sandwiches and too many iced cakes, so that now, out in the street, the air felt good to her, even if it was damp and cold. At the entrance of the apartment house, she took out her change purse and looked through it and found that by counting the pennies, too, she had just 87 cents, which wasn't enough for a taxi from 10th Street to 73rd. It was horrid never having enough money in your purse, she thought. Playing bridge, which if you look down at the note is a card game, when she lost, she often had to give IOUs, and it was faintly embarrassing although she always managed to make them good. She resented Lila Hardy, who could say, Can anyone change a ten? And who could take ten dollars from her small, smart bag while the other women scurried about for change. She decided it was too late to take a bus, and that she might as well walk over to the subway, although the air down there would probably make her head ache. It was drizzling a little, and the sidewalks were wet. And as she stood on the corner waiting for the traffic lights to change, she felt horribly sorry for herself. She remembered as a young girl she had always assumed she would have lots of money when she was older. She had planned what to do with it, what clothes to buy and what upholstery she would have in her car. The air in the subway was worse than usual, and she stood on the local side waiting for a train. People who took the expresses seemed to push so, and she felt tired and wanted to sit down. When the train came, she took a seat next to the door, and, although inwardly she was seething with rebellion, her face took on the vacuous, which means empty, look of other faces in the subway. At 18th Street, a great many people got out, and she found her vision blocked by a man who had come in and was hanging to the strap in front of her. He was tall and thin, and his overcoat, which hung loosely on him and swayed with the motion of the train, smelled unpleasantly of damp wool. The buttons of the overcoat were of imitation leather, and the button directly in front of Mrs. Bishop's eyes evidently had come off and been sewn back on with black thread, which didn't match the coat at all. It was what is known as a swagger coat, which if you look down means a popular coat style of the 1930s. But there was nothing very swagger about it now. The sleeve that she could see was almost threadbare around the cuff, and a small shred from the lining hung down over the man's hand. She found herself looking intently at his hand. It was long and pallid, which means pale, and not too clean. The nails were very short, as though they had been bitten, and there was a discolored callus on his second finger, where he probably held his pencil. Mrs. Bishop, who prided herself on her powers of observation, put him in the white-collar class. He most likely, she thought, was the father of a large family and had a hard time sending them all through school. He undoubtedly never spent money on himself. That would account for the shabbiness of his overcoat, and he was probably horribly afraid of losing his job. His house was always noisy and smelled of cooking. Mrs. Bishop couldn't decide whether to make his wife a fat slattern, which is a sloppy woman, or to have her an invalid. Either would be quite consistent. She grew warm with sympathy for the man. Every now and then he gave a slight cough, and that increased her interest and her sadness. It was a soft, pleasant sadness and made her feel resigned to life. She decided that she would smile at him when she got off. It would be the sort of smile that couldn't help but make him feel better, and it would be very obvious that she understood and was sorry. But by the time the train reached 72nd Street, the closeness of the air and the confusion of her own worries had made her feelings less poignant, which means deeply felt, so that her smile, when she gave it, lacked something. The man looked away, embarrassed. Part 2. Her apartment was too hot, 
and the smell of boiling chops sickened her after the enormous tea she had eaten. She could see Maud, her maid, setting the table in the dining room for dinner. Mrs. Bishop had bought smart little uniforms for her, but there was nothing smart about Maud, and the uniforms never looked right. For a minute, she stood in the doorway trying to control herself, and then she walked over to a window and opened it roughly. Goodness, she said, can't we ever have any air in here? Robert gave a slight start and sat up. Hello, Molly, he said. You home? Yes, I'm home, she answered. I came home in the subway. Her voice was reproachful, which means critical. She sat down in the chair facing him and spoke more quietly so that Maud couldn't hear what she was saying. Really, Robert, she said, it was dreadful. I came out from the tea in all that drizzle and couldn't even take a taxi home. I had just exactly 87 cents, just 87 cents. Say, he said, that's a shame. Here. He reached in his pocket and took out a small roll of crumpled bills. Here, he repeated and handed her one. She saw that it was five dollars. Mrs. Bishop shook her head. No, Robert, she told him. That isn't the point. The point is that I've really got to have some sort of allowance. It isn't fair to me. I never have any money. Never. It's got so it's positively embarrassing. Mr. Bishop fingered the five dollar bill thoughtfully. I see, he said. You want an allowance. What's the matter? Don't I give you money every time you ask for it? Well, yes, Mrs. Bishop admitted. But it isn't like my own. An allowance would be more like my own. Mr. Bishop sat turning the $5 bill over and over in his hand. And how much do you think you should have? He asked. $50 a month, she told him. And her voice was harsh and strained. That's the very least I can get along on. Why, Lila Hardy would laugh at $50 a month. Fifty dollars a month, Mr. Bishop repeated. He coughed a little, nervously, and ran his fingers through his hair. I've had a lot of things to attend to this month, but, well, maybe if you would be willing to wait till the first of next month, I might manage. Oh, next month would be perfectly all right, she said, feeling it wiser not to press her victory. But don't forget all about it, because I shan't. As she walked toward the closet to put away her wraps, she caught sight of Robert's overcoat on the chair near the door. He had tossed it carelessly across the back of the chair as he came in. One sleeve was hanging down, and the vibration of her feet on the floor had made it swing gently back and forth. She saw that the cuff was badly worn, and a bit of the lining showed. It looked dreadfully like the sleeve of the overcoat she had seen in the subway, and suddenly... Looking at it, she had a horrible sinking feeling, as though she were falling in a dream. That passage is by Sally Benson, excerpted from the story The Overcoat, from the American Mercury, July 1941. Question number one. The first paragraph creates a sense of, one, submission, two, urgency, three, frustration, four, Hopelessness. Question number two. The use of the word although in line 12 signals Mrs. Bishop's one, disapproval, two, enthusiasm, three, nervousness, four, resilience. Number three. The soft, pleasant sadness, line 40, Mrs. Bishop experiences while listening to the man cough indicates that she is 1. Discouraged by the illnesses spread on the subway 2. Inclined to help those in need 3. Pressured to act graciously in uncomfortable situations 4. Reassured by those who are less fortunate than she Number 4. Lines 44 through 46 convey Mrs. Bishop's one, confidence. Two, insincerity. Three, optimism. Four, hostility. Number five. Mrs. Bishop's thoughts in lines six through eight contrast with her statements in lines 64 and 65, revealing that she, one, 
exaggerates her feelings to manipulate her husband, two, hoards her money to cheat her friends, three, demonstrates her neediness to agitate her husband, four, flaunts her wealth to impress her friends. Number six, the details in lines 74 through 76 suggest that Mr. Bishop is one, puzzled, two, uneasy, three, suspicious, four, selfish. Number seven, the figurative language in lines 84 and 85 reveals that Mrs. Bishop is one, confused about her values, two, relieved of her discontent, three, forced to face reality, four, pleased to learn the truth. Number eight, in which lines is the central idea of the passage most clearly revealed? One, there was a discolored callus on his second finger where he probably held his pencil, lines 31 and 32. Two, but there was nothing smart about Maud, and the uniforms never looked right, lines 49 and 50. Three, he reached in his pocket and took out a small roll of crumpled bills, lines 60 and 61. Four, it looked dreadfully like the sleeve of the overcoat she had seen in the subway, line 83. Number nine. The primary conflict in the passage is Mrs. Bishop's, one, perception of herself, two, relationship with Maud, three, reluctance to help others, four, friendship with Lila Hardy. Reading Comprehension Passage B, Storm Warnings. The glass has been falling all afternoon and knowing better than the instrument what winds are walking overhead, what zone of gray unrest is moving across the land, I leave the book upon a pillowed chair and walk from window to closed window, watching the stiff boughs strain against the blotted sky, and think again, as often when the air moves inward toward a silent core of waiting, how with a single purpose time has traveled through currents of unguessed fatality into this polar realm, this present island. Whether abroad and whether in the heart alike, come on, regardless of prediction. Between foreseeing and averting change lies all the mastery of elements which clocks and weather glasses cannot alter. Time in the hand is not control of time, nor shattered fragments of an instrument the breaking of a cordon of events. The wind will rise, we can only close the shutters. I draw the curtains as the sky goes black and set a match to candles sheathed in glass against the keyhole draft, the insistent whine of weather through the unsealed aperture. This is our sole defense against the season. These are the things that we have learned to do who live in zones of much inquietude. That's by Adrian Cecile Rich. Poem Storm Warnings from Harper's Magazine, April 1951. In line one, when it said the glass, it was referring to a barometer. Number two, um, in line 20, when it says the breaking of a cordon, a cordon is a string. In line 24, when it said draft against the keyhole draft, that's just the British spelling. Uh, number four, an aperture is an opening. And for number five, the last word of the poem, uh, an inquietude is a disturbance. Passage B, questions. Number 10, the figurative language used in lines 9 through 11 suggests the, one, anticipation of life's challenges, two, questioning of life's meaning, Three, appreciation of patience. Four, importance of solitude. Number 11.
The purpose of the repetition of weather in line 13 is to imply, one, an uncommon occurrence, two, a personal connection, three, a beneficial circumstance, four, an unexplained phenomenon. Number 12, the statement, the wind will rise, we can only close the shutters, line 21, most likely means we, one, can overcome problems by denying them, two, cannot predict our emotions, but we can learn to ignore them, three, can control events by understanding them, four, cannot prevent our distress, but we can choose how to deal with it. 13. Lines 27 and 28 convey a sense of 1. Disinterest 2. Acceptance 3. Urgency 4. Terror Number 14. The poem suggests that the narrator views storms as 1. Having unpredictable results 2. Being frightening experiences 3. Being familiar events. 4. Having destructive powers. Reading Comprehension Passage C. Wherever humans have gone in the world, they have carried with them two things, language and fire. As they traveled through tropical forests, they hoarded the precious embers of old fires and sheltered them from downpours. When they settled the barren Arctic, they took with them the memory of fire and recreated it in stoneware vessels filled with animal fat. Charles Darwin, if you look down, Charles Darwin was an English naturalist who developed the scientific theory of evolution. Darwin himself considered these the two most significant achievements of humanity. It is, of course, impossible to imagine a human society that does not have language, but given the right climate and an adequacy of raw wild food, could there be a primitive tribe that survives without cooking? In fact, no such people have ever been found, nor will they be, according to a provocative theory by Harvard biologist Richard Wrangham, provocative means thought-provoking, who believes that fire is needed to fuel the organ that makes possible all the other products of culture, language included, the human brain. Every animal on earth is constrained by its energy budget. The calories obtained from food will stretch only so far. And for most human beings, most of the time, these calories are burned not at the gym, but invisibly, empowering the heart, the digestive system, and especially the brain, in the silent work of moving molecules around within and among its 100 billion cells. A human body at rest devotes roughly one-fifth of its energy to the brain, regardless of whether it is thinking anything useful or even thinking at all. Thus, the unprecedented increase in brain size that hominids embarked on around 1.8 million years ago had to be paid for with added calories either taken in or diverted from some other function of the body. If you look down, the word hominids is the taxonomic title for a family of great apes and humans. Many anthropologists think the key breakthrough was adding meat to the diet, but Wrangham and his Harvard colleague Rachel Carmody think that's only part of what was going on in evolution at the time. What matters, they say, is not just how many calories you can put into your mouth, but what happens to the food once it gets there. How much useful energy does it provide after subtracting the calories spent in chewing, swallowing, and digesting? The real breakthrough, they argue, was cooking. Food is a subject on which most people have strong opinions, and Rangham mostly excuses himself from the moral, political, and aesthetic debates it provokes. Impeccably lean himself, he acknowledges blandly that some people will gain weight on the same diet that leaves others thin. Life can be unfair, he writes in his 2010 book, Catching Fire, and his shrug is almost palpable on the page. Palpable means touchable. He takes no position on the philosophical arguments for and against a raw food diet 
except to point out that it can be quite dangerous for young children. For healthy adults, it's a terrific way to lose weight, which is, in a way, his point. Human beings evolved to eat cooked food. It is literally possible to starve to death even while filling one's stomach with raw food. In the wild, people typically survive only a few months without cooking, even if they can obtain meat. Rangham cites evidence that urban raw foodists, despite year-round access to bananas, nuts, and other high-quality agricultural products, as well as juicers, blenders, and dehydrators, are often underweight. Of course, they may consider this desirable, but Rangham considers it alarming that in one study, half the women were malnourished to the point they stopped menstruating. They presumably are eating all they want and may even be consuming what appears to be an adequate number of calories based on standard USDA tables. There is growing evidence that these overstate, sometimes to a considerable degree, the energy that the body extracts from whole raw foods. Carmody explains that only a fraction of these calories is in raw starch and protein are absorbed by the body directly via the small intestine. The remainder passes into the large bowel, where it is broken down by that organ's ravenous population of microbes, which consume the lion's share for themselves. Cooked food, by contrast, is mostly digested by the time it enters the colon. For the same amount of calories ingested, the body gets roughly 30% more energy from cooked oat, wheat, or potato starch as compared to raw, and as much as 78% from the protein in an egg. In Carmody's experiments, animals given cooked food gain more weight than animals fed the same amount of raw food. And once they've been fed on cooked food, mice, at least, seem to prefer it. In essence, cooking, including not only heat but also mechanical processes such as chopping and grinding, outsources some of the body's work of digestion so that more energy is extracted from food and less expended in processing it. Cooking breaks down collagen, the connective tissue in meat, and softens the cell walls of plants to release their stores of starch and fat. The calories to fuel the bigger brains of successive species of hominids came at the expense of the energy-intensive tissue in the gut, which was shrinking at the same time. You can actually see how the barrel-shaped trunk of the apes morphed into the comparatively narrow-waisted Homo sapiens. Cooking freed up time as well, the great apes spend four to seven hours a day just chewing, not an activity that prioritizes the intellect. The trade-off between the gut and the brain is the key insight of the expensive tissue hypothesis proposed by Leslie Aiello and Peter Wheeler in 1995. Rangham credits this with inspiring his own thinking, except that Aiello and Wheeler identified meat-eating as the driver of human evolution, while Rangham emphasizes cooking. What could be more human, he asks, than the use of fire? In Rangham's view, fire did much more than put a nice brown crust on a haunch of antelope. Fire detoxifies some foods that are poisonous when eaten raw, and it kills parasites and bacteria. Again, this comes down to the energy budget. Animals eat raw food without getting sick because their digestive and immune systems have evolved the appropriate defenses. Presumably, the ancestors of Homo erectus, say Australopithecus, did as well. But anything the body does, even on a molecular level, takes energy. By getting the same results from burning wood, human beings can put those calories to better use in their brains. Fire, by keeping people warm at night, made fur unnecessary. And without fur, hominids could run farther and faster after prey without overheating. Fire brought hominids out of the trees. By frightening away nocturnal predators, it enabled Homo erectus to sleep safely on the ground, which was part of the process by which bipedalism, which means using two feet for locomotion, and perhaps mind-expanding dreaming evolved. By bringing people together at one place and time to eat, fire laid the groundwork for pair bonding and, indeed, for human society. That passage was written by Jerry Adler, excerpted and adapted from The Mind on Fire from Smithsonian.com, June 2013. Passage C questions. Number 15. 
When the author cites Darwin in lines 5 and 6, he most likely does so to 1. Stress the equal importance of language and fire. 2. Show scientific theories change over time. 3. Suggest migration played a role in evolution. 4. Lend credibility to the discussion. 16. Lines 9 through 11 serve to 1. Present an argument. 2. Explain an image. 3. Resolve a controversy. 4. Dismiss a counterclaim. 17. The phrase energy budget, line 12, serves to emphasize a 1. Reduction of conservation efforts. 2. Scarcity of combustible material. 3. Limited amount of body fuel. 4. Restricted knowledge of resources. Number 18. The physical structure of hominids was altered, lines 17 through 25, as a result of their increased 1. Meat consumption and changes in food preparation. 2. Diet variety and changes in food preservation. 3. Demands for physical exertion. 4. Opportunities for problem solving. 19. In the context of lines 26 through 32, Wrangham's quote, a terrific way to lose weight, is most likely meant to be 1. Poetic. 2. Hostile. 3. Ironic. 4. Theoretical. Number 20. According to lines 40 through 44, the standard USDA tables may overstate caloric intake because they do not account for 1. How the body converts food into calories. 2. The importance of calories from protein. 3. The way calories are measured. Or 4. How the body adjusts to excessive calories. 21. The use of the word ravenous in line 46 suggests that microbes in the large bowel are 1. Deadly 2. Aggressive 3. Healthy 4. Energizing 22. According to lines 53 through 55, a key benefit of cooking food is that it 1. Completes the body's need for collagen 2. Prevents the body from absorbing fat 3. Aids the body in fighting disease 4. Assists the body in digesting food 23. Which statement best contributes to the development of a central idea in the text? 1. Life can be unfair, he writes in his 2010 book Catching Fire, and his shrug is almost palpable on the page. 2. It is literally possible to starve to death even while filling one's stomach with raw food. 3. And once they've been fed on cooked food, mice, at least, seem to prefer it. And 4. Animals eat raw food without getting sick because their digestive and immune systems have evolved the appropriate defenses. Number 24. The tone of the passage can best be described as 1. Critical 2. Informative 3. Doubtful 4. Hopeful